Ah, draft physics video. Yeah, why not? Uh, comments, uh, mostly, partially maybe, and uh, some other bits. <laughs> Something like that. You'll probably just get to the basic stuff again because people keep wanting f clarification, it seems, or needing it anyway. And it just doesn't seem like I should have to clarify it over and over again. But anyway, let's just do it. Um, so Daniel Hipper is 62. For clarification, is it your hypothesis that we live in a pressurized universe? Yes. Of photons traveling at the speed of light. That's sort of redundant. Um, the argument is, is, you know, first I called them tons and then quantons. Well, quantons first and tons or whatever. Um, the idea is, is you have to get rid of your ideas of what they've called things and just, you know, stick with electron. We'll use that. Proton. We'll use that. And then everything else, we're going to give it a new name because they haven't named things right. So, there's really, um, all right, well, anyway, I'll finish the sentence. Traveling at the speed of light, accounting for all the forces we experience, such as gravity, magnetism, strong and weak nuclear forces. So everything you said there is accurate-ish, except the word photon is going to get you into trouble. Unless you understand a photon to be uh, a quanta of energy. And a photon would be a quanta of energy at a frequency, meaning it would have many little bits to it, and they would be separated by distance. So there'd be a bit, and then no bit, and then a bit, and then no bit, and then a bit, and no bit. And so the only difference between gravity and photons, um, in terms of looking at them, if you could see them going by, if you could see it moving by, would be the photons have a regular interval between their presence. And because it's polarized, okay, so that the, I mean, I'll go over it two or three times maybe, and saying it in different words, but this is what everything is. It's this, just this stuff moving the speed of light, little bits, and each one has a vector it's moving. It moves in a straight line. So I, so I analogized it to arrows just to give the idea that it's moving the speed of light and it's moving in a straight line and it just does that forever until it hits a piece of matter that is a, an electron or a proton but until that happens it, it doesn't matter how many of these things it hits it just keeps going straight and the photon as you call it would be this stuff it's just that there's black arrows at specific intervals, very accurate intervals, because they were trapped between electrons. That's where photons are created. But this is what it is. And this is also magnetism when you filter it. So a magnet filters this stuff and makes all the red stuff come out one end and all the black stuff come out the other end. So magnetism is a function. Magnetism is something magnets do. And when you magnetize a metal by using a coil, an electromagnet, you're doing the same thing. You're turning it into a filter. So it behaves like a magnet. It filters this stuff. But it doesn't make something called magnetism. It's not a new force. It's the same force, just it's now filtered. So all the reds end up bouncing around inside until they come out the top and all the black that comes in bounces around comes out black uh, red or however the red black filter and I've uh, demonstrated on the website the nuclear forces are just the fact that the electron and the proton are the monopoles of magnetism in the sense that the electron filters the red and the proton filters the black in that it sends the black perpendicular and the electron sends the red perpendicular instead of creating <coughs> um, linear straight line uh, reflections. So I have called them force bits instead of photons to try to clarify. So if we just change what you said, um, 
for clarification, is your hypothesis that we live in a pressurized universe of force bits traveling at the speed of light? Yes, the speed of force is what it should be called. <laughs> Accounting for all forces we experience, such as gravity, magnetism, strong and weak nuclear forces. Yes, that would be the accurate way to say it. I feel it's a, 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 a complete enough statement that nobody of any kind of good faith could misunderstand, but who knows. All right. Um, so, uh, a Mark, a Mark Kool Kinnison, a Russian guy, I guess, or something. Anyway, a uh, light pressure system or a force pressure system. I'm trying to fault for a while now that but no luck oh it's stupid of me just brilliant and so simple well simple is true and even the original particle gravity theory of Lesage uh, but well the French guy Frontier or something he should get the credit actually um, you know he proposed it first and quite aggressively and was quite shabbily treated <laughs> You know, he worked at it his whole life and uh, couldn't get a, a receptive ear. And <clears throat> the simple problem was a thermodynamic problem of the fact that you, the, the field pressure um, would cause a consequence um, if you thought of things as being so everything being solid balls. The consequence would be as if you try to move through the field, you'd end up hitting stuff harder you were moving towards um, and you know it, it's a it's a real criticism but it's one that I think people reasonable people should have said well since we have no real theory of inertia no real theory of velocity you know people just think stuff moves you know and especially when you, you establish the existence of atomic theory and you knew that the electron and the proton could be moving elements, there comes into the equation this whole complex theory about how any kind of matter moves. We just say, how do those bits have this multiple momentums? You know, how can an electron spinning this way also have a velocity this way? Uh, wouldn't those things be in conflict in that as soon as you approach <coughs> any kind of fast speed, you'd be compounding the two speeds, adding them, and well exceed the speed of light. Um, certain things like that. So they should have known that there's probably a deeper explanation to what creates velocity in material objects, and they shouldn't be so dismissive of a theory that has that as its dilemma, because there may well be an explanation. And I've sort of provided that. I don't really want to make this video about that, so I won't go into the details, but um, suffice to say, <coughs> well, I will say later. Um, yeah, I will. <laughs> so, um, I don't exactly know what he meant by this. Tan's statement would be X. There's no force as. Uh, yes, I don't know. It's word games. I don't really understand exactly what the... I don't know what that means. Uh, so another comment by the same person. We all have preconceptions, beliefs. Hard to even imagine that there are so few people who are trying to be critical thinkers engaged in debate, debate I guess. Um, belief gets in the way of learning. Albert A. Heinlein. Um, uh, yeah, well, it, clearly garbage in, garbage out, so you want to try to get the garbage out before you do the going in thing. So the less garbage you have already existing, the less junky <laughs> the, the new stuff will get. So in that sense, um, you do have to have uh, an open mind, um, you know, but it is hard where we're... we're you know, people like answers. They like conclusions. They don't like dissidents. They don't like, um, I don't know. That's not a great feeling, I don't know. So people tend to be able to 
aggressive in drawing conclusions. Um, can't say I'm, I'm invulnerable to that, but in this case I'm clearly the person who wasn't invested in the, um, the parade of physics as it was going by. I was not pleased with what I was seeing right from the start, and um, so I wasn't uh, marching with that band, however you want to metaphor it. Um, so then some asshole, Ferris Wheeler, appropriately a wheeler, so <laughs> most wheelers I guess are assholes, um, yep, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what explains why he doesn't understand the most basic concepts. Well, um, prove that, or argue that, with something called evidence. What's clear is, is that most people don't understand the basic concepts. They have huge misconceptions about what actually, how experiments work, what the results are, or how accurate the math is all kinds of misconceptions and you're just defending that with this kind of rubbish comment um, he is deluded beyond all reason so I mean just an insanely excessive and aggressive statement and for which you produce nothing not a single shred of evidence um, I mean shit and then he's politely asked what concepts are you meaning he doesn't provide any answer, of course. So we'll just do away with Kid Ferris Wheeler. Seems an obvious fake name, but whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fuck you. Simply and plainly. Um, all right. So another. Um, who knows? Uh, a little bit complicated here. All right, so Richard Stone says, Hi, Draft Science. Well, it's, it's nice enough. Uh, to assist you with your description at 15, and, you know, post another link to the video, uh, you know, a time code, which, you know, I'm, I just don't know if that's useful. Uh, <clears throat> this video. Regarding of where, regardless of where in the universe you stand, your backyard, or in between two galaxies, should you move one inch to the left or right or back or forward or one light year or one micron or what atoms radius, you uh, will always see something, especially if you could see in the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Then, yeah, well, I think everybody would believe that. I don't even know what that means. You think you can step out of the universe? It's kind of a tr good, you know, good trick if you can do it. Uh, the universe is saturated with photons. So again, I would argue photons are a tiny, tiny, I mean photons being represented as electromagnetic spectrum, that is stuff at a frequency. Stuff coming at a precise frequency is a tiny percentage of the energy in the universe, the force. Most of the force is doing gravity and magnetism. That's the thick force. Light is a tiny, 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 tiny bit of the spec of the force spectrum. All right. <clears throat> um, invisible light is even more puny. So this is the problem with the word photon. It just some people think photon means just the light part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, some people say photon. Okay, the entire electromagnetic spectrum. But they really don't understand that photon has one outstanding feature, well, two. It's speed, but this, it's the same speed as gravity and magnetism, so that game's sort of over. Um, and frequency. <laughs> so it's clearly a specially, uh, a, a refined piece of force. All right, anyway. Um... The universe is saturated with photons. I'd imagine more so with force bits. Like I say, photons are force bits. They're just force bits at a frequency. Uh, countless trillions of times more so. Imagine now if the universe instantaneously froze. Every t everything, time, and all but you. 
and imagine you could see all the photons and force bits. No, photons slash force bits would be a better way to say it. Photons are force bits. All right. They're just specialized. Uh, the universe would look solid. Well, I don't know if it really would look solid because they're clearly bits, especially in the case of the photon. So if you, I mean, obviously we can't see distances as small as nanometers, um, so they would look awful close together. <laughs> you know, so everything would look awful congested. Um, but the polarization in itself, if you could see that, it would certainly give color. Um, you know, there would, it would, there would be differences in the structure that you could notice. But clearly, there's a lot of the stuff in one little inch of space. There are so many of these little things that you clearly couldn't see the little things, and clearly they're very small. <laughs> So both of those things are working against your capacity to perceive them. But also, which is true, the force bits go right through the force bits. So my vision wouldn't see them because it doesn't see them now. My photons aren't, don't interact with the force bits. Force doesn't interact with force. So in some sense, you could never see the force bits, you could still only see the material bits. Alright. Thank you for all your videos. Please keep up the good work, Richard. Do what I can and such. Um, uh, let's see. Alright, so Bob Hicks responds to that. Uh, helpful, I would imagine that's the intent, but I don't know. Uh, Richard. Um, doesn't this support the doesn't this support the light is a wave idea if light if light is composed of particles wouldn't you expect to occasionally find a spot between particles well clearly there are spots between particles it's just they're so small i mean <laughs> There's a billion uh, in in this much space. How could you see the space between a billion little things that tightly associated? There's there and there are like could be a billion times smaller than the space between them. We don't have any definition of their size. They could be just so damn small. Um. All right, when you expect to okay, okay, my thinking is both light and gravity are composed of particles traveling in waves. Well, gravity doesn't need to be traveling in waves. And the you know, gravitational wave detector isn't detecting nanometer scale waves. It's detecting huge wavelength waves by comparison. So that doesn't really work, um, but let's continue. I mean, 300 cycles in 100 seconds is only 30 cycles a second, right? 3,000, yeah, 30 cycles a second, right? Or 300. Well, regardless, those are both very low frequencies. You wouldn't even be able to hear them, they're so low. Um, anyway. My thinking that is that both light and gravity are part of the weight. That way, if a few particles missed a point in space, they would be followed so closely by others that the void wouldn't even be detected. Well, yes, the fact that they're moving so fast and are so densely packed, uh, you, we would need we need to theorize about what we would see because we can't do it. We have to imagine it. But it's imaginable. I can imagine it. I can see it in my brain. <laughs> you know, little things following each other and being very crowded. Anyway, that might also explain the speed limit rule that says particles' mass cannot exceed 300,000 kilometers per second. Uh, 
300,000 kilometers per second. I guess that's 3 million meters, yeah. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, the problem with that, um, you know, establishing speed limits for matter, I think, like I've said before, that the speed limit is because the matter is actually composed of force and that the matter's velocity is a byproduct of the force it has captured. And um, you can't get around that kind of problem, in my opinion. The little bits are, the, the electrons are being pushed by force, and the force between the little bits is all force going in a certain direction. And, um, you know, so um, speed is a collecting of force. And so if you collect force going the speed of light, you, all your force has to be going the same way. You can't have any going the wrong way. So you're now a one-dimensional object and you're basically force. So it's not like there's a limit. There's a limit to how, how durable matter is. And matter won't survive that speed. It converts into force. All right, maybe 300 kilometers per second is simply the velocity of the fastest bits, yes, ever measured. Well, I don't think the ever measured thing is even necessary because it's not like you put them on a track and measure them. What we can measure is effects, and there's no effects happening, you know, cause and effect. We don't see anything um, in any substantive experiment where the effect happens at any rate faster than the speed of light. So you don't have effects moving faster than the speed of light. And so essentially there can't be a cause moving faster. And maybe waves are so-called pure energy. Well, again, I, that I'm not even going to touch. Um, I don't see any point. Um, you could say but if I said there was such a thing as pure force, I would say it was the unfiltered force. And so, but unfiltered doesn't mean strongest, you know, because of the relationship between protons and electrons. And the strongest force is really the force you get when you start moving two electrons closer and closer, and you start bouncing the little force bit back and forth between them, and that. As you bring it closer and closer, the number of impacts increases and increases and increases and increases. And that kind of energy multiplication is pureish. Anyway, um, do not exist at all. And waves of so called uh, pure energy do not exist at all. Well, again, waves exist in the sense that you can release a whole bunch of something at intervals and those could be called waves but they're not waves in some traditional notion of conventional physics in which they think there's a medium and you're just creating an upward change in the pressure like there's no real movement of a wave there's just the medium you know, going like this, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and going like this at another spot and going like this at another spot. You know, their, their waves aren't things moving. They're just a transfer of pressure that moves. And they don't describe that mechanism where um, medium waves, waves in a medium, are very different than waves in empty space. Waves in empty space have to be made out of particles moving, not just going, not just agitating a medium. All right. Or haven't yet been detected. Yeah, well, whatever. Um, there's a lot of stuff we can rule out as being detectable just because of this cause and effect thing. All right. Um, Felipe uh, Bassonet uh, probably belongs in one. Uh, you know the Earth id flat 
slash 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 right question mark 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 ah, it's brilliant so anybody who disagrees with you about anything is a flat earther is that how it works for you fella hmm? that's not an argument of any kind I clearly don't believe in a flat earth and I don't believe in magical little uh, Huygens waves. Do you believe in that? Do you believe that every every um, photon creates an infinite number of little wavelets in front of it when it encounters a slit? Do you believe in that? Mm -hmm. Philip? Philippe? Do you? Huh? <laughs> you don't think that's ridiculable and mockable? It's so fucking silly. You believe in God? Mm -hmm. Silly person, huh? what do you believe in, you asshole? <laughs> well, I don't really care to know, to tell you the truth. You're clearly without an argument. You got no bullets in your gun. No, no dick. Uh, no other way of saying it. Micro penis, much, Philippi. Uh, pathetic. All right. Um, so then, uh, oh yeah, Mr. Krebs, ha ha ha. It just doesn't inspire much, those kind of screen names, I gotta tell you the truth. Just, you know, kind of just, uh, asshole. Uh, anyway, here's a link about LIGO, you know, L-I-E, go. Um, so this is a link I've already, I, I went to this like three years ago or something. Uh, two years ago, whenever the, the first discovery happened, and I, you know, it, the guy does a, a kind of a, it's not a simple critique, but it's superficial in the sense that he doesn't think through the argument very deeply, and so he makes critiques that are, in my opinion, not very accurate um, about the technology. So, I mean, one of them is just the curvature of the earth thing. And he has this impression in his head that they just made the earth flat and curved and then built their LIGO on top of a flat curved earth and therefore their tunnel, their tube, would have to be on a slope, you know, to account for the four feet of difference. You have to, you know, you have to go through four feet. So you have to essentially, I guess it is, you have to point downward <coughs> four feet. Um, but that's not how they did it. They did that when they leveled the land. So they leveled a, a hundred yard wide path and they cut it to be flat. So they cut the curvature of the earth off when they leveled the ground. So the tube being the same height above the ground is exactly how it should be because they leveled that whole hunk of ground to be to cut out the earth's curvature and then he showed the japanese one which is a tunnel that the tube is in and they did the same thing the, the tunnel was made for the purpose of the ligo so they cut the tunnel to go the four feet down the four foot difference in grade. So, I mean, it's kind of a simple, you know, he's making a bold accusation that they can't even do this because their their tube is crooked. And I'm not even saying they're that stupid. <laughs> I mean, so, come on. Uh, you know, he should figure that there's probably a way they thought of that and they realized that their laser can't go in a crooked line. <laughs> you know, and it's only four feet, for fuck's sake. It's not like, you know, it's not very much ground to have to level. So it's kind of a... But anyway, so his video has a couple of good points in it, but a lot of them are like that, in the sense he starts talking about the tube moving and the heat and this and that and all this other stuff. And it's really not an issue because everything is in the vacuum, technically. Um even the mirror, you know, which is suspended by a whole apparatus and everything, that whole chamber is vacuum. So, um, you know, it's just not a, it's not, 
you just ain't getting it. It ain't the tube that's doing this. It's just the mirror that's doing the moving. But anyway, technically. All right. So, um, you know, uh, I, ha I haven't, you know, I've got to get this writing stuff done, but I just haven't done much of it. But anyway, I was working on just vocabulary because this seems to hang people because of all these traditional words are just so broken. So I, I have been working on vocabulary. And so, yes, I call matter bit. That is to have force moving in the three dimensions. So, see, but that one I'm going to have to break in a sense because electrons, it's possible they're only two-dimensional. It's possible. But it doesn't really matter. The, the, the point is, is the matter bit is the, fit, the bit that's... The, the force bit is stuck together. So the matter bit has, it's like the inverse of this pressure. So this, 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 this chaos will create all by itself, without any help, this order. That is, you're only gonna be hit by things moving in a straight line heading right for you. So from your perspective, you're gonna feel like the inverted light bulb. Like the whole world is just shooting at you, the whole universe. Because all the stuff that misses you will be irrelevant. And the only stuff that's going to hit you is going to it's going to be coming from every direction equally, just like the opposite of a light bulb. You're just going to be you're going to be feel you'll you'll be like it's you're getting picked on. You're you're, you're being singled out with this pressure. And the matter bits are like exactly the opposite of this. The, the, the matter bits are basically force going out in every direction. A little piece of force. And when they acquire new force, they exchange one of the force bits they have. So like a bunch of arrows in all directions, and if there's an imbalance in one direction, they'll acquire that imbalance, they'll keep that, and they'll get rid of something going that way, or that way, or that way, or that way. Something going some other way. And that's how matter bits acquire velocity. But they, they possess the capacity to exchange. So, like I said, I have to do more with that. The, it's obvious, it should be more complicated to make a sentence <laughs> definition of the matter bit just because it is it is more complex and I certainly have it's you can be less descriptive because it's not as simple as the properties of the force bit all right so a force bit I have that defined as only have materiality in one dimension so they only have identity in one direction they only have mass in one direction the direction they're going in. They're invisible to everything else. They can reflect nothing in any other dimension. They can affect matter in no other way but the direction they're traveling. They can't brush up against it sideways or do so. They can only hit it. You know. And uh, they move the speed of light and they have uh, polarization. And that's it. And that those that sim those simple properties, polarization and moving the speed of light and existing in only one dimension at a time, <laughs> is all they have. They have their direction, the speed of light, speed of force, and they're polarized either red, blue, plus, minus, whatever you want to call it. All right. Force trap. Now that's an interesting word, right? Force trap. So the force trap is the whole idea of the four right turns. The idea that what a, a material bit can do, or an atomic bit, let's say, because a proton and an electron can't do it, but a neutron maybe can, is it moves energy, or the forces, in a trap. So it moves this way, and it leaves perpendicularly, and it leaves perpendicularly, and it leaves perpendicularly, and it's trapped forever, theoretically, potentially, in those right turns, or left turns, or any direction turns. Four of the same turn will always put you back where you started, essentially. And that's the mechanism that 
creates um, what we think of as of stored energy, potential energy. And it's the mechanism that allows matter to have momentum, to gain velocity, and to keep it. So as long as it keeps the force trapped, then it can put its mass on the side of the of of the direction where it has more force. And so it will spiral its way in a direction. All right, quanton, which I thought was a good word, but that would be another word for the force bits. They're all just quanta. Uh, they're all identical in their force, in their mass, however you want to describe it, their capacity to do interaction. And the only thing that's different is that polarization thing. Um, and the only difference, well, I'll, make, I'll still get to that. Uh, perpetual motion, so that's another word for that is associated with the force bits because they're the only thing that has true perpetual motion in the sense it's by the very function of the its elemental function is moving the speed of force uh, three million um, meters per second um, and that's what it does and matter to have perpetual motion when I throw a wrench in space and presume it to just keep going until it hits something what's happening is I put force into it and it keeps the force in those traps and as long as it keeps the force in those traps it will keep going in the direction you throw it so it's gained perpetual motion but it didn't have it innately it had to capture it from force All right, um, probability that's a that's a word that comes up a lot and um, there's all kinds of things that happen at, at a probabilistic rate in that you're, you know, it's, there's inevitabilities created by probabilities and in over time periods so you could say if you flipped coins pennies for an hour you know you'd know it would be pretty inevitable that you'll get at least one head <laughs> you know, you're just not going to be able to ev evade that reality even if I gave you all the time in the universe, you, there may be, there's probably no way to calculate it, but the fact is it'll never happen. That in an hour's time or of whatever, 10,000 flips, you'll never not flip ahead. Anyway, um, so um, these are sort of important distinctions between the three forces. And I should add the atomic forces, um, but they're really magnetism, frankly, um, just on the personal monopole scale. It's the monopole version of magnetism. Magnets are dipoles, electrons and protons are monopoles. All right, so gravity is mixed polarization and no frequency, I should add here. So it doesn't have any of those the, those two specialties it doesn't have. You haven't filtered out all the red from the black. The red and the black are mixed and none of them are coming at a regular interval. And that's gravity. Magnetism is concentrated or segregated polarization. So a magnet happens when you create a filter that makes the black do one thing and the red do another thing. That's a magnet. Light photons. So I would argue that they're the, the black arrows that um, are the ones reflecting off of electrons. So the, the red goes out perpendicular, the black reflects. And it's the black electrons between, it's the black force between the electrons that is uh, that accounts for uh, what we call photons because as the electrons get closer together they create a tighter frequency of vibration and that's what gets released so x-rays would be a smaller frequency because it's because electrons were pushed very close together they don't like it very powerful and that's why um, that 
amount of force, that, that frequency of force can have um, um, more impact on an electron. Anyway, um, so light photons, it, it's the black force, and it's um, polarization at a fixed frequency. So it's not only segregating the black and the red, but it's also putting the little black arrows in, at a specific time interval between them. And that's the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, time is a function, nothing else. Nothing special about it. It's just a byproduct. The existence of time is just a byproduct of the fact that the forces move something slower than instantaneously. And that's why there's something called time. If the force bits moved instantaneously from one place to another, there wouldn't be any time. And everything already would have happened, <laughs> and we wouldn't be having this conversation in this very slow manner, because it's the matter bits that are slowing down the game, because it takes time for force to influence the matter bits. Alright, so I think that's enough for this video. And, um, you know, got lots to work on, and so if you have some kind of counter argument about how the conventional physics has it all right and this stuff doesn't work in some way, then point it out and do so in some sort of reasonably polite manner. Uh, but otherwise, uh, whatever. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think the argument can be made that there's nothing in this theory that is inconsistent with 99.9% .9 of observed experimental data and such. So, till next time and such.